morning, everyone. I call this uh, Committee um, of Economic Development to order. I want to note that we do have a quorum. Um, we have two sets of minutes. Um, Rep. Richardson, have you had a chance to look at the minutes from February 15? Yes, Madam Chair, and I'd like to move the, the minutes. Um, discussion? Being none. All those in favor of um, approving the minutes from uh, February 15 and March 8, please say aye. 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 All opposed, minutes are approved. Uh, Rep. Leslie God, welcome to the committee. You're the only person that can bring this many people on a Friday morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I want to note that he brought treats, so I'll have. I teased him about treats. He ran up to his office and brought treats. <laughs> All right. Um, we have House File 2059, uh, the Film Board Tax Credit. I'll move uh, House File 2059B, we refer to the Committee on Taxes. Please tell us your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I am happy to bring uh, forward House File um, 2059, which would expand Minnesota film and TV um, credit program. Um, thank you for giving me this time. Um, as you can see by the audience, that it, it is extremely important. Two years ago, uh, we passed into law in Minnesota the first film and TV credit with the goal of creating a powerful economic opportunity for the state. <laughs> and it has not disappointed. Tax credit programs like this have an impressive track record in other states and around the world. Now, we here in Minnesota have an opportunity. Current law has the program at the very modest amount of five million with a sunset in place. My bill would extend it to 25 million and eliminate the sunset. You may ask why, and I'll explain why. Um, right now, it is when you're trying to build that foundation of an industry that is searching for places to go. You look at Hollywood in LA, New York, Georgia, there's so much content on TV today that the opportunity is there, but this is a but-for situation. And I want to tell you my story. So back in 2000, you guys all know I'm passionate about mining. Mm -hmm. I lost my job, and I went back to school. I was 27 years old, uh, married with two children, and I took a, um, an extra, uh, extra class. You know, you got to take those... And I took theater, and I was encouraged to um, encouraged to participate in audition for a film called North Country. Mm. And North Country was based on a true story, class action lawsuit um, that stemmed from Northeast Minnesota in the mines. And it was the first. Um, I think it was the first case, if I'm not mistaken, in the United States where this issue was going to be addressed. And uh, with the courage of Lois Jensen, played by Charlize Theron, it changed how people, how people do it. I mean, it was, it was incredible. I said no, to be honest with you. When I, uh, I went and auditioned, at first I wasn't even going to audition, but then I did the math, teacher asked me to audition, said you're a former steel worker, they're looking for, uh, you know, minors, and so I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I went there, I auditioned, two weeks later, Mally Finn um, from L.A. offered me the part. I told her no. She said, she said really? And I said, uh, I said no, I said, uh, that's not really, that's not who I am, I don't want to portray that. She said that that, that, is what, uh, that is what acting is. I said, well, I said, I, I don't want to do it. <laughs> then um, Ricky McManus um, called me and asked me if I really said no. And I said yes. And she says, uh, I would encourage you to, uh, to do it. And so I said, I did it. And at that time on the Iron Range, um, we were devastated. 1,400 people just lost their jobs. Um, just catastrophic because there is no other opportunity. 
And what I saw happen when I was able to participate in this film is I saw an industry come in, hire local people, stimulate our economy like I've never seen before in such a short burst. They came into it at a time when we needed it most. And then all of a sudden, they packed up, and I didn't know why. They were going to Santa Fe, New Mexico to finish shooting the film about an extremely important case stemmed from Minnesota. And I got asked to go out to Santa Fe, and I did, and it was wonderful. And I couldn't figure out why we were out there. Well, then I found out that we, they offered a tax credit. We lost a large portion of that story, those jobs, those opportunities for our communities because we didn't have no incentive. So three, four years ago when they asked me to carry this bill, it struck me and uh, it hit me here because I saw what this industry did for my community, my region, and the opportunity they could, it could have for the state of Minnesota. Make no mistake about it, this is a jobs creator. It is an opportunity that we can build on. This isn't giving money to Hollywood elitist. This, these are working class people that are here to tell a story. Stories about Minnesota, stories from across the country. Ones that make you feel good, ones that make you feel sad, ones that make you think but they're jobs. And I know that, you know, 25 million, not everybody's gonna think that that's, the, that that's the right one with no sunset, but it is. It is the right thing to do because it's gonna create that foundation, it's gonna create that workforce that this will continue to grow and develop and that foundation will be here for a long time after. So um, that's it in a nutshell. Um, I know that there's testifiers here that are very passionate about it. They see the opportunity, they, they work, they live in the industry, and they see how this industry impacts people's lives. So with that, Madam Chair and members, I would turn it over to the testifiers. All right, um, the first testifier is Malady Bahan, <clears throat> Executive Director of Minnesota Film and TV. Please welcome to the committee, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Melody Bayhan. I'm the Executive Director of Minnesota Film and TV and a member of the Minnesota Film Alliance. Uh, thank you for allowing me to testify. We are grateful, we as a community, as an industry, are grateful to the legislature for passing our first production tax credit in 2021. And we are very proud of the 10 projects that have chosen Minnesota because of the program and the more than $20 million in new spending it has brought to the state. But the 2021 bill was a small pilot and we need to take the next step to fulfill the promise of more spending and higher paying jobs for Minnesotans. Since our tax credit program began, other states recognizing the economic benefits of film and TV production have continued to strengthen their tax credits, making our program the smallest in the country. We are looking at a landscape where most other programs have annual caps ranging from 30 million to 400 million, or in 14 states, no cap at all. We have also struggled a bit with the sunset on the program. Um, films and episodic programming can sometimes take years to develop, and having a four-year sunset has cut us out of many of the discussions about films and development, and certainly out of any discussion of an ongoing series. Again, if you look at what Minnesota is competing with, most states with strong industries doing TV and streaming series have either extended or in many cases eliminated their sunsets altogether. Other states have recognized the value of these credits and this bill will help Minnesota, Minnesota to more of what we are already doing very well. Decision makers in the industry have shown great interest in investing in our state and there is more to come if we can expand and improve our program. An increase to 25 million and elimination of the sunset in Minnesota would allow us to turn the interest generated by the passage of the tax credit into commitments from studios to bring their business here and provide high paying union jobs that come with it. 
thank you for allowing my testimony and I'm happy to take any questions. We'll hold questions until the end. Uh, the next testifier is Hannah Alstead, Political and Labor Director, Teamsters Joint uh, Council 32. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Hannah Alstead. I'm the political director for the Teamsters Joint Council 32, representing 75,000 members across Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Iowa. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of House File 2059. In 2019, film and TV projects went through the state's rebate program and made for a total spend of $7.6 million. In 2022, that number was $20.8 million. That was due in part to the creation of the state tax credit. It was great progress, however, we're currently losing larger productions episodic projects, and stable Teamster jobs to other states that offer more competitive programs. The longer Minnesota remains out of the running, the further we move down the list. We can handle more, and we want more. The Teamsters Motion Picture Division consists of 12,000 members at 74 local unions across the country. These members work as drivers, location professionals, casting directors and associates, animal trainers, handlers, and wranglers dispatchers, DOT admins, mechanics, chef drivers, chef assistants, and more that support the production of film, feature films and television. If this bill becomes law, hardworking Minnesotans, including many Teamsters that I represent, will have the opportunity to secure high paying jobs that will allow them to put a roof over their family's head, food on the table, and even put away some for a rainy day. I had the chance to go to Los Angeles in 2019 with Minnesota Film and TV. We met with executives from organizations like Entertainment Partners and the Television Academy, along with so many others, where labor was not just a consideration in those conversations, it was the center of those conversations. From the cast to the crew, to the carpenters and electricians, to the drivers, to the people working on the projects, they're all union, union trained and represented. What I took away from all of this is that this industry doesn't just forget about labor. This industry is labor. From IATSE to SAG-AFTRA to the Teamsters, this is an industry that saved people during the pandemic. Creators and the people bringing those creations to life kept the world moving even when it stopped. I speak on behalf of all of my union siblings in the film and TV industry when I say we're ready to get to work. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Brian Simpson. Can we please hold our applause uh, until the end? Thank you. Um, Brian Simpson, please introduce yourself for the record. Actually, Madam Chair, um, we don't traditionally applaud in committees at all. I recognize that you know, this particular bill is used to uh, audiences and clapping, but... Uh, That's fine. We'll, we'll let that one slide, but... <laughs> <laughs> It's Friday morning, and we're happy the community is here with us, so. We, they could uh, be demanding an encore if, we, if it gets out of control. Right. Please introduce yourself for the record. <coughs> Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, my name is Brian Simpson. I'm a member of IATSC Local 490. Um, you heard about the jobs. I'm kind of going to tell you a little bit about the jobs. Uh, Local 490 is a labor union that represents film and TV crew in the state of Minnesota. Our members work in almost every aspect of film and TV production. Like here in this room right now, you see a big crowd. We have office staff, prop masters, wardrobe stylists, location managers, script supervisors, grips, gaffers, electricians, painters, set carpenters, set decorators, makeup artists, sound mixers, craft services, set medics, and even maybe special effects. Um, our members are everywhere, and they are real Minnesotans working real middle-class jobs. Um, while all of our members are skilled technicians in their craft, these jobs do not require a college degree. Film and TV production is modern day manufacturing that is entirely dependent on human labor. These jobs are not robots, they are not automated, they cannot be replaced uh, with anything else than human labor. Um, these are all real people working real skilled professions. Um, House File 2059 
uh, this bill we're talking about is a job creator that needs to be expanded. If House File 2059 were to pass as written, our current labor force would not be able to satisfy the increase in production. This would allow Local 490 and the Minnesota film industry to aggressively expand with new job creation and new jobs training programs. Some of that job growth will be handled through on-the-job training. Some of that will be uh, longer-term programs. Uh, Local 490 has already begun working on this issue by partnering with Inspire MSP um, to create a path for underprivileged youth in the Twin Cities to find career opportunities in film and television production after they graduate high school. The film and TV jobs that will be created by House File 2059 will be union jobs. Film crew will receive health and retirement benefits, they will be protected by collective bargaining agreements, and they will be paid middle class wages. Film production tax credit has had a great start so far. Uh, but we have a lot of room to grow. And with your help and your support, uh, as the bill as written, we can make that happen here in Minnesota. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Up next, we have Michelle Scott. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Introduce, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michelle Scott, and I'm a general manager of a local hotel on the Iron Range. Um, I, and I'm here to talk about the positive impact that the filming productions in the industry has had on just my hotel alone. Because we're a, not a chain. We're only an independently owned hotel that doesn't get the benefits from other chains and help on improvements. Um, so just alone in the last year with the filming productions doing three small low bu budget films and a couple of nonprofit workshops in my hotel that I am managing, they had brought in $100,000 of revenue. And because of that $100,000 revenue that we had gained from them, we were able to put back as of right now, 35,000 of that back into our building, not only for material wise for updating the building and doing some major repairs, we were able to hire on a few other um, construction workers, handymen, etc. And we plan on putting on putting more money back into this building. Um, oh boy, I'm nervous. You're okay. You're, okay. You're doing good. Yeah. <laughs> You're um, doing good. <laughs> with with that money being spent, just alone, we put that back into. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, a local hardware store, drug store, along with spreading that funds within 20 miles between Hibbing and Virginia local hardware stores. Now, with the filming production as well, they have also spent at the Casey Drug Hardware Store in Chisholm as well, they had spent $32,000. And our small community, that's a big um, profit, um, a huge, I mean, we haven't seen something like that in years. Um, All together, they have done $35,000 in locations on renting buildings and people's homes for filming. <coughs> they have um, done $40,000 in catering to feed the filming crew car rental just in one film in 14, that was a 14 day shot. That was $10,000 put out there. That w would have never been spent. Um, as well as they've hired locals. My daughter had the opportunity to film in one of the films. She made money as well as they do hire out other locals to be extras in the films as well as helping on the sets, building the sets. Um, I'm losing track. <laughs> uh, now with that money, she had made just her for two days of filming, she made over $600 on take home after taxes. Obviously a seven year old girl at that time, what does she want to spend money on? Toys and candy. <laughs> but she also only took 200 of that and spent it on toys and candy. But she also wanted to put that into her own savings account for college. Not only with the filming productions that they hired on, 
They also hired a TV, uh, Minnesota licensed teacher to be on production because not only my daughter, but another student or a student and an actor was a school age child and their school was in session. So that's also bringing back, putting more money into education. And obviously they're concerned about having the education, which to me that is very important. Mm -hmm. um, kind of got off track here. Uh, so not only has the film production has been putting revenue in, they've also made an impact on our local communities by inspiring others. Just alone, one of the producers had inspired even personally my own son because he had questions about if on an Easter egg theory between two movies and he had asked one of the producers on it and the producer told him to write that script. Mm -hmm. Now by him telling him to write that script, he has been writing every day, which has had in, improved his English grades. We're talking from C's to D's to A's and B's. Mm -hmm. I mean, where else could you get that from? Having somebody with that much of a power to inspire somebody to write. <clears throat> um, and these, just the filming productions has put back with two films that I know of what they've spent on budgets. They had put back or put into our community over $108,000. Chisholm is 5,000, 6,000 population. A little under five. little under five. That's a huge impact. I grew up the, my whole life on the Iron Range between Haven and Chisholm and I've watched every store close. Stores get knocked down stores being vacant, but now they're not. They're being used. Um, not only has, like, they bring back that. Um, during one of the filmings, one of the producers made friends with a firefighter, which is they had hired the Chisholm local fire department to be part of. They hired him. Uh, one of the firefighters became friends with and went partners and bought a bakery at that time, the bakery was in jeopardy of closing because the previous owner had an health issues and passed away shortly after. Not only are they going to be opening up the bakery and making sure that it's staying open, they also did an Airbnb, bringing back more into the community. Thank you very much for Thank your you. testimony. <coughs> Discussion on the bill? Uh, Rep. Igo? or who wants to go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to thank you, Representative Lizard, for bringing this bill today. Um, you know, a lot was spoken about the range and how this has impacted, you know. The film industry coming to Minnesota is a huge opportunity for not just the Iron Range, but all of Minnesota. Um, and in my experience being up on <clears throat> the range and kind of working with some of these films that have came to Minnesota, the reason they're coming is because we're so diverse. Because if you go an hour in any direction in this state, you can get to new different demographics, you can get to uh, new topography, you can go to Lake Superior, you can go to the Plains. Um, and that's really attractive for film companies because then they don't have to get on planes and go places. So if Minnesota can become a place that attracts that kind of business and brings it, so not only just can greater Minnesota benefit, but so can Metro Minnesota, right? We have a uh, wonderful city center down here in Minneapolis, St. Paul, to do wonderful filming in as well. So I'm glad that we're going to be removing the sunset on this bill today. You know, obviously it's a great bill for the range, but it's a great bill for Minnesota. So I can't appreciate you enough for bringing this bill. Thank you. All right. Winner, do you have a comment too? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I love being on economic development. It's, it's been extremely educational for me. Uh, locally, we, will, we worked with economic development for years, how to pull businesses into rural Minnesota. So the film industry is, is entirely new to me. I understand how uh, the theater classes and so forth would prepare you for politics. I, I think that's, that's kind of an amazing <laughs> process. <clears throat> um, my, uh, the other thing that the testifiers and yourself have brought up, and I think it's a great point, is how taxes can either pull people in and pull people and businesses into an area or the state or push people out. And I think that's a great point that needs to be uh, carried across a lot of different bills that, that affect us. Um, the one question I do have is 
you know, do we expect with this tax credit to see, and is there more projects in the near future, you know, in case they need a large bald person, you know, I, I would be interested. <laughs> <laughs> So is there any other plans for the future or, um, you know, what, what kind of growth can we expect w with uh, the money? Please. Chair, less of the God. Madam Chair, I guess I would like to turn that over to uh, the industry leaders that okay. have a, a better feel of what potential could come. So, Melanie. Who wants to come up? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Representative um, and Madam Chair. Um, we are, our office, Minnesota Film and TV, uh, uh, we are in conversation with producers, networks, filmmakers every week who are interested in coming to Minnesota, um, uh, but are holding off until they find out what happens here, um, frankly, because, uh, for example, we are uh, in conversation with a major uh, cable network uh, about a series that is set in Minnesota. Um, and we really, really are, are doing everything we can to get them here. Um, but with the sunset, it, they won't come. Um, if we can eliminate the sunset and make this increase, we could see um, in the next year uh, a major network series shooting in Minnesota. No promises, but we're certainly talking with them about it. All right. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, I do yes. have one, uh, another individual that okay. uh, Upper Midwest. Sherry, please, come you please come up and introduce yourself for the record. Hi, my name is Sherry Marshik. I'm the executive director of the Upper Midwest Film Office. We work in tandem with the Minnesota Film and TV Board. Um, and we, our concentration is on the northern part of the state, but we support the whole state. On a regular basis, we have a running list of productions that call us that are interested, want to understand our credits and our incentives, and then ask about our workforce and our infrastructure. And any given day, that list can be between 20 and 30 projects with budgets somewhere between 60 and $80 million total that is just running. And not all those projects are going to come. We would never say that they are all because, um, as Melody explained, that those projects, some of them aren't applicable to us and some of them need a longer runway. And they're looking at 2025, 2026 in order to come um, here. So we, yes. Every day there are projects that are um, calling us that are interested in shooting here because of all the things that we offer and because of the infrastructure that we're building and the teams here that are so dedicated. So thank you. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up? No. Okay. Uh, Lead Kosnick. Thank you. I just had, uh, I think I figured out uh, my question, but if we could clarify, I had a question about uh, the repealer in um, appendix but I think it's just repealing the expiration date, but not the other parts of uh, sub 116U.27 um, that required a report, uh, the minimum investment in that. If I, I just could get a clarification from uh, House Research, and I understand it. Okay. You want to go to the tax research? Chair and members, I can confirm, yes, that's just repealing the expiration date. Okay, okay thanks. That's... I got a little concerned that we weren't going to do that. One of the parts of that is a, a report that I think is valuable to us as a committee of uh, list the projects that are generated from this later on in the report that are important. And, you know, when we talk about economic uh, development, I think there's a lot of support for this particular investment uh, from the state in terms of credits. Uh, you know, we look for diversity of industry sectors. This is an uh, in industry that we haven't talked about a lot in this committee, and we haven't done a lot in the state, but also it encourages entrepreneurism. As we talked about the uh, affiliated or associated um, businesses that would benefit, so I appreciate that. And also, you know, working to promote a climate that um, is responsive to the needs of business, and I think Representative Listlegard, uh, the industry is saying, we want to do this work and just need to uh, be competitive, and that's what I think we're trying to accomplish here. So it kind of meets the benchmarks that uh, we should be striving for in economic development um, and to provide economic growth statewide was mentioned. 
And so the, the other thing that we maybe should focus more uh, if we can, uh, I think this will be a lot more tangible in this particular model of economic development is that um, we're gonna generate economic activity only because we are doing this um, credit that we will, the economic activity won't happen unless we do this, but for this credit, but for this uh, investment of state resources, we would not normally see some of the projects coming here. So I, you know, it's a little bit of a gamble. We're increasing the size of the credit, but I think uh, it's a good opportunity for Minnesota to uh, say, yes, we want this industry here and we want it to grow and flourish. Thank you, Rep Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I'm impressed by the forethought that you had us hear this bill on Oscar weekend. <laughs> really well done. <laughs> Rep. Lagarde as well. Uh, I just wanted to speak in favor of this. Uh, as someone who started a cinema here in Minnesota, this is a industry that's near and dear to my heart. And I think the uh, testifiers, thank you for testifying today, did a great job of saying often when people think of making a film, you think of the director, the actors. Um, and certainly they're important to the process, but the almost literally thousands of other people that make a movie happen um, from caterers to renting cars to renting the equipment to buying props at local stores to contractors uh, being hired to build sets and included in that is carpentry and you have to buy the wood to make that happen. It goes on and on and on the economic opportunity that this brings. So uh, I'm really excited about this and I also wanted to speak on the sunset being removed which in this industry is massive because Planning a uh, major TV show or a film is not something that happens in 12 months, sometimes not even 24 months. And so uh, companies, as they're looking at where they're going to shoot, to see that this is going to be something that is available when they're going to shoot is massive. And uh, as Rep Wiener said, we talk a lot about um, taxes causing people to move or not move. And to be honest, I often think that those are dubious claims. But in this particular case, uh, I know Minnesotans who live in California or New Mexico or Georgia who would like to come home, but they just need to know that they can work when they come home. Um, and this will provide that. So thank you, Rep. Lissagard, for bringing this forward. Really excited about this bill. Thank you. I want to thank the community. I know many of you guys drove hours in the snow. Uh, that shows that your commitment to this cause. And uh, we appreciate hearing from you, uh, from you because you elected us, you put us in the seats, and um, seeing this many people on a Friday morning tells me this is an important bill. Um, do you have a comment? Oh, one more comment. Go ahead, Rep. Thank you, Chair and uh, Representative Lissagard. And to our community, I just wanted to chime in. I know we have a room full of our Northeastern Minnesota folks. And um, if you haven't seen the 2002 study that was put out, maybe it was mentioned here, rolled in a little late, but I would encourage everybody to check that out. Um, I think this is a really good bill as we've heard the return on investment. Um, you know, in this economic development committee, we wanna know that the dollars that we're putting in as a state and a partner are effective. And um, that report shows that for every incentive dollar, uh, $6.90 are returned back, which is higher than any industry. Um, and I saw the picture of you, so I'm, I'm sad that, uh, <laughs> I, I love to see this on here. Now I know that you were in North Country. I, I wasn't in Mary Kiss Cam, but maybe in the future. <laughs> <laughs> but I just have to say, like, as a Duluthian, um, you know, we are firing on all cylinders, as you've heard um, in our community in the Iron Range. I know in this committee we actually heard Film North, which was a project um, that is paired into this industry and into um, these tax credits that will also work down here in the metro area. And I've been hearing from business owners, from community members who have been writing in and, and emailing saying exactly what we heard either. It's entrepreneurs who are seeing the support of the industry being there, lodging and folks who are in prop and hair. I also want to specifically also just shout out that the work that's been done with um, Part of this is supporting our entrepreneurs of color. Um, we worked really closely with how can we have lots of force multipliers and co-benefits 
And we've heard uh, diverse media who are wanting to come. And <laughs> I'm excited to hear the unveiling of which, which one it is. But um, just in the bit of time with my at the city, I know that um, those calls come in and they can come in anywhere. And the more that we can do to help set up that ecosystem to really draw that in and set it up, um, I think we ought to invent, uh, invest in it. So I just want to thank you to the storytellers and the creators and um, our labor workers in this room who drove down um, and took your time out to come here. I think this is really important as we talk about the challenges with you know, property taxes and these things. This would help us to grow our property tax base. So I could go on and on, but I say, um, you know, let's raise our hats to you by raising the cap and uh, extending the sunset. Thank you. Okay. All right. Chair Leslie God, <laughs> your final thoughts on the bill. Well, I, I just thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. What a wonderful um, discussion, and I truly appreciate all of your support. Um, you know, uh, there's only so much ongoing money going uh, going to be happening, and I would encourage all of you to seriously take a, a good look of what this can bring because um, it's going to be competitive in the end right we all know that and so uh, but this is going to create jobs it is going to improve people's lives and so uh, and then you know I just have to comment on the uh, on uh, one of my testifiers from Chisholm it's not easy to come here when you don't speak in public but for you to come here and share your story and how it's impacted your lives and that's all across the state of Minnesota for these small business owners. And so this is an opportunity that is before us, the state of Minnesota, to grow something that could enhance everybody's lives and the state of Minnesota. This industry has an unbelievable potential of economic growth for us. And we need to seize that moment. It's 25 million of ongoing, no sunset, but just think of the positive things that it can do for us. All the wonderful comments that we heard here today, I just ask you when it, when it comes time to uh, make the tough decisions, that this is included in the final one. And you all are welcome to uh, sign on to this wonderful bill as co-authors, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> so, Madam Chair, thank you so much for uh, hearing the bill. All right, well, the Chair renews uh, her motion that House File 2059 be re-referred to the Tax Committee. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion prevails and the bill is re-referred re to the Tax Committee. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we have another bill on the calendar uh, for you. House File uh, 1781. Yeah. Do you want us to do the, the the other bill and you can say bye to people? We'll give you a moment to say bye to everyone. We'll just hear another bill. Thank you, Dan. Oh. <laughs> That's fine. We, yeah, you could go. We'll, we'll Rep. Coulter, is it Rep. Coulter here? Okay. Okay. All right. We're going to mo uh, move things around and we're going to hear uh, Rep. Coulter's bill. Uh, members, I brought Sambusa this morning, so I don't think you want to call Sambusa, so if you want to go grab <laughs> Sambusa while we transition into, yep. Wow. Do you want me to get one? Yeah. There's also uh, there's fry bread uh, if you want one too. You got to behave. Yeah. <laughs> if you want one. Oh. <laughs> I'm more behaved on fries. Oh. I'll <laughs> grab some for you guys. Oh, they are warm. You know, I'll sit you don't want them to fall. I figure I'm asking. Oh. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a vegan. So which one is There are no vegan. I'm I'm from a culture that has no vegan in it. Um, <laughs> We're very judgmental. Yeah. Rep. Coulter, welcome to the committee. I move that House File 1659 be laid over for possible inclusion.
rep culture, please introduce yourself. Can we keep the noise down, please? Thank you. Please introduce yourself. Uh, not yourself, your belts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can introduce myself too, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, so, I, I, first of all, I kind of feel like coming right after a ranger. I should just say it's a good bill. Vote for it. But um, we'll go a little bit more in depth. Um, so, House File 1659 would appropriate $10 million through the Bloomington Port Authority in funding for the World's Fair Expo 2027 host organization. This is an exciting opportunity for the city of Bloomington, for our state, and really for our entire for our entire country. Even just hearing the phrase "World's Fair," I think, carries with it a certain amount of excitement. It calls to mind images of iconic structures like the Eiffel Tower and the Space Needle. Needless to say, this kind of effort would be a massive undertaking, and it really would require an all hands on deck approach, which is why we're bringing forward this proposal. Uh, House File 1659 is, of course, co-authored by the entire Bloomington House delegation. And I also want to thank uh, Representatives Hornstein and Doubt for their support as well. Uh, if the Bloomington site is selected, a massive amount of work would need to be done in relatively short order, and a significant amount of funding would be required. The funding in this bill would go a long way toward that effort. I recognize that $10 million is not an insignificant ask from this committee, um, but the payoff would be contributing to $2.5 billion in economic impact, including $365 million in state and local tax collections, in addition to a literally once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to show off Minnesota to the rest of the world. Um, so with that, I will turn things over to my testifiers. We have our mayor from the city of Bloomington, Tim Bussey, and our city manager, Jamie Verbrugge. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Mayor. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Madam Chair, members. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, and thank you for, to Representative Coulter for sponsoring this bill and authoring this bill. My name is Tim Bussey. I have the honor and the privilege of serving as the mayor of the city of Bloomington. The bill before you today is a very important request to continue supporting the efforts of the United States and the state of Minnesota in our pursuit of Expo 2027 and to plan for our success. Now, I know that not everyone is familiar with the Expo, so I want to provide a quick overview of what an Expo is, and then our city manager, Jamie Verbrugge, is available to discuss a little more detail uh, about the bill and what it does. So first off, what is an Expo? Well, very simply, it's a World's Fair. And yes, they still do those <laughs> all, over the, all over the world. The United States has a long history of World's Fairs, as Representative Coulter mentioned, including some iconic legacies, such as the Space Needle in Seattle, the Unisphere in New York, and the historic museums in Chicago. But it has been four decades since the United States has hosted a World's Fair. So a group of Minnesotans have been working with our partners in Washington, D.C. to bring the world back to the United States and to do it right here in Minnesota. Expo 2027 is a specialized exposition organized around the title Healthy People, Healthy Planet, Wellness and Well-Being for All, and a theme of health and well-being, which basically shapes all life on this planet. In all parts of the world, health and well-being is the, sing the, the single most important prerequisite for things like economic prosperity, a sustainable planet, and flourishing urban and rural life. To have success in any of these areas, we need to be a healthy, thriving people. Now, coming out of a global pandemic and amidst the challenge of climate change, the timing of this event focused on this conversation could not be better. And there is not a better place in the United States to host an event focused on the health and wellness uh, than Minnesota, where we have some of the leading research, education, manufacturing, and health delivery systems in the nation and in the world. I am frankly very excited that Bloomington will be the host city when we welcome the world to Minnesota. Again, thank you, Madam Chair, for hearing this bill and providing this opportunity to discuss Expo with you. As I mentioned, with me is uh, Bloomington City Manager Jamie Verbrugge, who, uh, if it pleases the Chair, would like to offer some testimony, if you would permit it. Uh, welcome, Mr. City Manager. Please introduce yourself uh, for the record and proceed. Uh, Madam Chair, sorry, if I if I could quickly, I uh, brief oversight here, I do have the A1 amendment just to get the bill in the shape that, we that will, I would like it in. We can, after the testimony, we'll, we'll take action on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And members, my name is Jamie Verbrugge. I'm the uh, city manager in the city of Bloomington. 
So Expo 2027 will be organized and operated as a public-private partnership. An independent, nonprofit 501c3 organization will be established as the host organization, and that organization is designated by the United States uh, government to plan and design, build, and operate Expo. So Bloomington will be the host city for the event. The public-private partnership financial model for Expo uh, relies substantially on revenues from corporate sponsorships and ticket revenues. The cash flow for Expo is heavily backweighted, with a large portion of the revenue coming from ticket sales and a secondary but also large amount coming from sponsorships. The challenge is that the host committee, and Bloomington is the host city, will need to immediately start work this summer long before the budgeted revenues come in. So the bill asks for $10 million to the Bloomington Port Authority to provide funding for the Expo host organization, and the funds would be provided to the host organization via an agreement with the Bloomington Port Authority, and those funds would be used to finalize the Expo community dossier, which is a requirement of the Bureau of International Expositions, for development planning and coordination uh, for real estate, development planning and coordination for public-private partnerships, the infrastructure design and planning, the financial modeling and projections, and to staff the host organization uh, to actually uh, uh, plan and organize and operate the actual event. So Mr. Or Madam Chair and members, um, this is really an exciting opportunity for Minnesota and for the United States and for Bloomington. And uh, really appreciate you giving us a chance to share it with you. The mayor and I are happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, I believe there is an A1 amendment. Um, let's uh, take action on that. Um, can you please explain what the A A1 amendment does? Uh, thank you. It, it really is uh, just sort of a technical amendment, just clearing up some language and, and putting the bill in, in proper form and function. Any discussion on the A1 amendment? <laughs> It's a little early on a Friday for me, but uh, there, there might have been, I thought, let me find it here. Um, oh, on the, uh, the amendments, uh, line 1.2, it's uh, it has the last word, not limited to. And on line 1.2, or excuse me, uh, on line 10 of the, the bill, would that add and would it had two twos in there so if you in, if you insert it after used <coughs> would it then it it just me but for act then it would read for activities included but not limited to to finalize or am uh, i reading we'll it wrong our um staff to look at uh, chair and members, no, it, it, because of the comma there, the, the two use is the use. So oh, it, there's it, a comma. Yeah, so. Excellent. Okay. All right. All those in favor of adapting the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, the amendment is adopted and the bill is in the shape that you would like. Discussion on the bill. Where's it going? Madam Chair? Uh, yes, Rep. Wiener, sorry. <laughs> Thank away. you, Madam Chair. Um, totally new to this again. Um, can you explain a little bit the the funding, how the money works with this? And also, this is contingent on um, um, the expo coming in. So is there money being dispersed? Or it's not, in the, excuse me, there's no money being dispersed until after the acceptance. Is that correct? And then as far as once the expo is done, is there infrastructure, structures you know is there things put in place that would uh, help the vitality of the area afterwards how does that all work rep Calter. Thank, thank you madam chair and um to the the i think it was the second of three questions um you are correct that the the funding would be contingent on the bid being awarded i would um direct members attention to lines uh 1.13 and 1.14 in the bill that that specifically does state that um to your third question i can i can speak a little bit to that that i know um, from my previous job on the Bloomington City Council, that um, the infrastructure and the design is very, mu very much being discussed, both in terms of um, serving the function of the expo, but then what comes next? How is that infrastructure and, and the buildings that are constructed, how is that going to be used to um, 
further the vitality of that particular area of Bloomington. I can tell you know from experience um, where other significant events have occurred, Olympics and so on, that that's, that's been something that a lot of folks have thought about. And um, I know our, our staff is, is very intently um, considering that with proposals moving forward. Um, I think as far as the details of the funding agreement, I'm gonna have to phone a friend and ask our, our probably our city manager um, to speak to that more specifically. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative. So the funding model, again, the initial budget for this is based uh, largely on the ticket sales and the corporate sponsorships. Uh, but it is a public-private partnership, and so um, there's, there's probably going to be uh, some funding that is necessary for supportive infrastructure and that type of thing. But it really is funding from all, you know, all three levels of government, the federal government, state government, hopefully, which is why we're here asking, and then from the local government, the city and county level. Uh, the federal government is strongly supportive of this. The, uh, the administration for President Obama, President Trump, President Biden, all three of those administrations have supported the Minnesota uh, application to host this expo. Uh, the Congress has allocated $25 million in support of uh, Expo uh, Pavilion in Osaka, which is a really important step. Uh, if we are to be awarded for 2027. So the federal government is strongly behind this. Uh, and the, at the local level, we've, we've committed significant resources in the pursuit of this as well and anticipate that um, we will have local responsibility too. So it is indeed a public-private partnership, very heavily reliant on the private piece of that. Rep. Wiener, do you have a follow-up? Well, I guess the, the flow of money, I guess, was more what I would like an explanation of, okay. if that's right. Does it go through deeds? Is it coming through different sources? After we allocate the money here, how does it get to the event? Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair, thank yep. you. Uh, the, the money from the state would be allocated through deed to the Bloomington Port Authority. Okay. The Bloomington Port Authority would have an agreement with the host organization that outlines the responsibility and the accountability for the expenditure of funds and uh, we would be the responsible agency for administering that agreement. All right, That's one more? Follow yep, up. go Sorry, ahead. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, with deed taking that um, responsibility, then there would be reporting afterwards, is that correct? <coughs> yes. Is that a yes? Okay, yes, okay. yes. Okay. I see heads nodding, so <laughs> that's a yes. <laughs> okay, Rep. Uh, Lee Kosnick, unless someone else has a comment, no? Nope. You have a question? Uh, Madam Chair, since uh, they're being hesitant, I'm just going to ask. Um, <laughs> uh, it's an exciting opportunity. I know we've heard a lot about it, um, but just kind of a little bit more of the mechanics. Um, line 1.13, reimbursing before the expenses are incurred, just kind of that seems a little bit, um, usually it's a, a refund type thing, but just if you could talk about that a little bit, I'm sure there's a, there's a reason for it. Um, and then how much money can be expended expended all 10 million of this and still not get uh, be so the select no. nope so if you can clarify that for us that that would be wonderful um, and then tailing off of that would there be once Bloomington or Minnesota is selected will there be a, additional funds asked for the state or is this it all right who wants to take that <clears throat> uh, so I can I can take part of that and I, I um, I, if I understood your question correctly, and feel free to, to tell me if I didn't, um, you know, again, the, the appropriation is contingent on approval by the by the BIE, and that vote happens this fall. Um, and so, if if that if the Minnesota site is not selected, all 10 million goes back into the the general fund. So that's, I mean, that that's kind of the the end of the road there if it's not selected. Um, as far as the technicalities, I think I'll have to tap out again here. Mr. Madam Mayor. Chair, members, if, and, and to clarify uh, a bit with uh, uh, Representative Coulter's not uh, council member anymore, not council <laughs> anymore, uh, Representative Coulter's comments. The, the final decision by the Bureau of International Expositions, which is the organization in Paris, which decides where expos are held, will take place on June 21st. So we will know on June 21st whether or not Minnesota has has won the bid, and the expectation would be, if passed, that this 10 million dollars would then be distributed on July 1st, I believe, and. Uh, Again, with the thought that 
if and when Minnesota wins this bid, we are literally going to have to hit the ground running as fast as we possibly can to make sure we are ready for 2027. And to have this money uh, available to begin the planning and the work that needs to go into that is a very important part of that. And, uh, and again, working through our uh, Expo 2027, the organizational board that's putting it together, uh, Right now we are in, if, if you think about it, if you remember the, the, the Super Bowl, we had a bid committee for the Super Bowl and then the Super Bowl host committee, the operations committee. Right now we are in the bid committee area, the world, part of the world. We ultimately will stand up, if, if Minnesota wins, we will stand up a, a host committee which will take on all of these responsibilities and take on all of the planning and, and organization and ultimately the development and building of the site. If I could follow Final up, Madam Chair. So in order to uh, be in the process, it takes some resources, so you're doing di separate fundraising, non-state revenues to get the dossier ready and the application ready, is that? And Mr. that's not part of this. The, the responsibility of the organization, Mr. this Mayor. nonprofit that is, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize, <laughs> right, Madam Chair. Fine. Madam Chair and members, uh, the, the organization that has been working on this to this point, Minnesota Expo 2027 has done that, done that. It's raised significant funds both privately uh, and through uh, the city of Bloomington, uh, Hennepin County has, has contributed as well. Um, and, and I will note also we, we have uh, unanimity among our Minnesota congressional delegation. All eight representatives, both senators are, are in support of this. And uh, we also like to point out this was also has been supported by the last three presidential administrations. Mm -hmm. uh, looking back, we're trying to find another thing that all three of the past presidential <laughs> administrations have agreed with and supported, and this is one of them. So uh, we, we believe we've got strong support at, the, uh, at the, the federal level, certainly at the, the local level for the fundraising that has taken place to fund the operations that have gone on so far with the hopes of uh, continuing this in, in the future. Again, funding it with the, between the, the, this public-private partnership, so yes, there, there would be the hope, the expectation that there would continue to be additional public funding that would be available, but also there would be the expectation of significant revenues from both ticket sales and from sponsorships. Uh, for example, for the, you know, the official soft drink of Expo 2027, there comes a price tag with that and that will help fund through sponsorship. Do you still have more follow-ups? Yeah, maybe more just kind of a wrap-up, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, you know, I think generally this kind of also meets the but for test, and, you know, it's an exciting opportunity to showcase the state and happens to be in Bloomington, which is, um, might be reasonable. I, you know, if it's a health thing, I'm sure there might be some shuttle buses down to Rochester. But... Um, <laughs> Figured you'd look up. Um, you, you did mention down the road there could be additional state revenues uh, requested and support. Do you have any kind of ballpark and what, what that might entail? Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative. Uh, until the host organization is formed and the more refined budget is uh, put together, it's hard for us to say. I think we're the the folks who have been involved in this are confident that the preliminary budget is, is a good one and a strong one and that the, the um, ticket sales and the corporate sponsorships are going to um, take care of a good amount of the, uh, of the cost associated with the event. We won't know the final answer that until we get further into the planning process. Pete Kasnick, this will be laid over so this won't be the last time you see this bill. <laughs> yeah. right. I, I appreciate the effort, uh, Madam Chair, and um, just looking down the road of what, what further would be asked of the state, but I uh, appreciate the efforts and um, could be an exciting opportunity, but uh, still need to know what's going to be asked of the state and what I'm hearing now is this is initial money, there are going to be additional resources, but we don't know how much that is. Slight concern, but uh, we'll continue. All right. Rep. Coulter, your final comments on the bill. I don't see any other... Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, members, for the, the thoughtful and engaged discussion. I um, would, first of all, just uh, reiterate again the, the significant bipartisan support that this uh, bid enjoys both at the state and at the federal level. I, you know, again, to the mayor's point, I'm, I'm having a hard time uh, thinking of anything that, uh, that Congresswoman Omar and, and Congressman Emmer agree on beyond this, um, and that's a, that is exciting to me. Um, because I, again, I think this really is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, you know, mine may be the first name on the bill and, and certainly if others want to sign on, you are, you are more than welcome to. Um, but I, I think this funding would be an opportunity for every one of us 
uh, to have some ownership, to have our own sort of little piece of uh, this opportunity to, to show off our state and, and what we bring to the world stage. So thank you so much for your consideration and, and just really want to strongly encourage inclusion in your budget bill. Thank you. Uh, and with that, the bill is laid over. Thank you for coming. Thank you. All right. The next Thank bill we have, um, we go back to uh, Chair Lestigard. Since today is his day in economic development. Yeah, way uh, to go, Representative Coulter. <laughs> you messed it up. We gave you a chance to say goodbye to your, your folks. So. Uh, no, thank you. And so it was Lee Kosnick's idea. All my fans left. I mean, so, so. Now you have no one to cheer no, up. No. House file. Uh, chair moves that House file uh, 1781 is laid out over for possible inclusions. Uh, chair Lissell, got to please tell us your bill. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, you know, 1781 is a agency bill. Um, and so with me today, it's about Giants Ridge. It truly is a gem. Uh, it's a state-owned facility in Northeast Minnesota um, that we are truly blessed to have. And with me today um, is Linda Johnson um, and that will be uh, presenting the agency bill. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Linda Johnson. I represent the Department of Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation located in northeastern Minnesota. Part of our mission is to diversify the economy of northeastern Minnesota. And back in 1984, the agency purchased a facility called Giants Ridge. We purchased it for $68,000 and have invested millions over the past 30 plus years. <clears throat> and it has become an economic driver especially on the east end of the Iron Range in between the cities of Aurora and Biwabic. The facility does over 100,000 visits a year. We have golf and skiing and most recently mountain biking, hiking. Um, we've had private sector development there that has been attracted over the years with our lodging components, our single family housing development, and it goes on and on. And today, as you can imagine, the infrastructure continues to age and we're looking at strategies to be able to create an account with the State Board of Investment that would invest agency funds so that that fund could grow so we could use that account to help offset our, our long-term maintenance accounts. Um, it's modeled after the Stillwater Bridge um, account that was set up. Um, the Min, uh, MnDOT contributed $7.5 in principal into the lift bridge account, which invested which was invested by the State Board of Investment to maximize the investment returns. And so again, this legislation would create an account uh, where the agency would invest the fund over a period of years. I'll take any questions. Rep. Igo. No, no, no questions, just as a member of the Iron Range Resource and Rehabilitation Board, I just wanted to speak to my support for this bill. Um, Giants Ridge really is a gem. Um, you know, I was just pulling some most recent facts on my phone there before I spoke. You know, the golf courses there are in the top 100 in the country, actually in the top 30. Um, we have an amazing facility up there. And by setting up this account today, it's going to allow the agency to continue to take care of that asset um, and allow for further public-private partnerships up there. And that's exactly what we want to do. You know, I, me personally, I kind of have a vision that one day that Giants Ridge is going to double, triple in size with an outside private investor, providing more jobs and bringing more people to see our great range. So I 100% support this today and hope the rest of the committee will do the same. All right. Any other comments? Rep Perryman. Oh, sorry. Nope. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just wondering, um, is there a time limit for when this funding and the um, funding mechanism will sunset? I hope not, but that's my opinion. Madam Chair, committee members, I am not aware. Mr. Callio, are you aware if there's a sunset? Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Dave Callio. I've been involved in the accounting at Giants Ridge for about 23 years now. The It's not really a sunset, I would say, but there's going to come a point where we wouldn't have to put money into it anymore because it would meet our goals. Once our goals of, you know, revenue plus the investment revenue equals what we're spending, 
there's really no need to put more money into it. And over, I've done estimates between 10 and 25 years. The max we would probably have to invest over 25 years would be 15 to 20 million to create a 60 to $70 million balance, which would create about a $6 million annual revenue to put towards Giants Ridge. That's on the high end. Maybe we can do it in 15 years, but we, we're just trying to create another revenue stream. Thank you. You have Madam Chair. Follow up. Just a quick. Uh, I, I love the bill. I think it's great. I've been there before. Um, don't tell anybody in St. Cloud that I go up there, but uh, maybe you you'll want to br bring some uh, a facility down to St. Cloud for us. Don't have any hills, but good open land for golf courses. <laughs> so thank you though so much for bringing it, and I I do like it a lot. All right, uh, Chair Leslie, got your final comments on the bill. Just real quick, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, I worked at Giants Ridge when I was 19 years old uh, and had hair and uh, you know all that wonderful stuff. But it has been a part of uh, Northeast Minnesota and on the East Range for a very long time. It's uh, three miles from my house. Uh, you know the quarry is number one public golf course in the state of Minnesota. Um, the ski hills, the investment. Uh, it's becoming more diversified. There's on, I believe there's only three um, uh, vertical trails for, for mountain biking. Um, so it's, it's truly incredible. And so uh, I can't thank the agency enough for their commitment over the years. This, is, this has been a transition over a long period of time to make this one of the best facilities, state-owned facilities in the state of Minnesota. So this is a wonderful thing, and I would truly appreciate your support. Okay, with that, uh, Chair renews her motion that uh, House File 1781 to be laid over, and the bill is laid over. Another bill for Chair Leslie Gott. <laughs> Thank All you, right. Madam Chair. Come All here. right. Today is Iron Ranch Day. In Iron here. Ranch Day. <laughs> um, We're special. Yeah. I'll move that House File 1783 uh, to be laid over. Please tell us about your bill. Okay, thank you so much, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, once again, um, this, is, this bill will provide the Commissioner of IRRRB with the authority uh, to design and implement programs to manage employee separation, retention, um, and recruitment. So with me today, um, I have a testifier that can walk through the bill. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Madam Chairman, committee members, my name is Marianne Buskey. I'm the Chief of Operations at Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation. Our request before you today is not monetary, but it's a request for authority to establish a separation and retention incentive program. The agency has a complement right now of 42 employees, of which 11, 26 percent, are at or near retirement eligibility. The separation and incentive retention program would assist the agency in strategically transitioning its workforce and hire new employees in a labor market with unprecedented low unemployment rates. It will also assist with the challenge of recruiting employees in our rural location. Under the authority of the provision in the statute, the agency will have flexibility in the use of compensation and reward incentives that support retention strategies and best practices that are valued by employees, such as linking compensation and benefit payouts to years of service. The authority will support a controlled approach to turnover and recruitment and help position the agency for success during a period of reorganization. From a funding standpoint, the agency's dedicated revenues from taconite production taxes, which we receive in lieu of local property taxes, would fund any programs that we develop. If granted this authority, the agency would work with its board and cover any costs associated with programs as a part of its annual operating budget. No general fund dollars would be used for any part of the programs. In terms of a history of legislation that's similar for Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation, the legislature has previously approved separation incentive programs for the agency, most recently in 2017. And during the 2022 legislative session, this very provision was included in the state government finance bill by both chambers, but that bill did not receive final approval before the legislative session expired. I'm happy to take any questions. I thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Discussion on the bill? Rep. Igo. This is being laid over. 
probably pick up, but Jerk is maybe not. Rip I go. I'm just going to speak to the bill. Um, again, this is, I can't speak high enough about all of our staff at the IRRR. Um, every <clears throat> single one of them there are just fantastic. And um, to do this kind of move so we can make sure to give those incentives and hire the next generation of team there is going to be crucially important. Again, there's even a sunset in this provision to give those who look at that kind of stuff a little peace of mind. So it's an easy thing for us to do to support an agency that's supporting all of the iron range. Thank you all for what you do. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments? I, I do yep. have a question, Madam Chair. Rep. Wien, please go Thank ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just as an educational aspect, maybe research could tell me, is there any other parts of the state where we do anything similar, or is this just tied to the mining um, in the northern part, or is this spread to different aspects of the state? Honor. Uh, Chair members, uh, are you speaking, asking about the the separation incentive programs or the IRRB in general? The IRRR now, I guess. Not not exclusively exclusively to the IRRB, triple RB. I'm sorry, um, but do we have the, the retention itself? Do we have retention and separation programs for any other areas of the state? I mean, do we have any? similar programs that affect different areas? Uh, Go ahead, uh, Jolene. Chair and members, uh, so I am I'm not a, by any means a, a state government expert. I know we have uh, authorized very similar programs for the IRRR in the past. So it, it's similar to those, but I don't know if, if about other state agencies. Okay, thank you. All right, final comments on your bill. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for um, doing this for me on a Friday and for all the members for to show up. Uh, you know, we're trying to meet uh, the first deadline, and so I truly appreciate it, 8.30 in the morning. Um, yep, you too, my friend. Yep, cookies for you. So, um, you know, this, all these bills that you heard today and, and, and this one, they're all important to uh, Northeast Minnesota and, uh, you know, obviously the first one across the state of Minnesota. But... Um, they're giving us the, this is giving us the tools to, to set up the agency moving forward. So I truly appreciate your support. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, Chair renews her motion uh, that House File 1783 to be laid over and the bill is laid over. Um, with that, members, um, I don't think we have any, anything else on the agenda and uh, we, our next meeting will be on. I just had one question. Yeah. Go ahead. And uh, it, it's not about the bill, but uh, since he's still here, when is this Ranger party? Does, is that next year? Or this? <laughs> so I mean, we had to come in here on a Friday, man. I know. So in all honesty, um, I uh, I'm doing a little more planning on this one. Um, this uh, no, there's going to be a theme. In the last four years, uh, we lost um, um, you know Senator Thomasoni, uh, former Representative Rukavina, um, Senator Doug Johnson, um, um, Joe Begich former Representative Joe Begich, and a whole host. So um, it's going to be next year in the beginning of the of the session where we can uh, put together something special to honor the past while embrace the future. So that is the goal. So And we get special seating because we were here on a Friday. Yeah. Oh, yes. Your... Oh, yes. Like <laughs> All right. Like Nothing it. stranger than the Ranger Party. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, members. Uh, our next meeting is our regular time on Wednesday, but I'm truly thankful for your time and commitment to come here on a Friday morning at 8.30. Have a good weekend. This committee is adjourned. Oh.